Welcome to the Senate E-12 Finance and Policy Committee. Today is February 11th. 2019, we have a quorum. Uh, today, members, we are going to hear six bills. Uh, we are going to focus on school safety, an issue that has been paramount in each of our minds and uh, our schools, our students, their parents uh, as well. Our first bill is Senate File 7. Senator Dames. Welcome, Senator Nelson. Will you please uh, move that Senate File 7 be laid over for possible inclusion on the omnibus bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do move that Senate File 7 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Uh, before you explain the bill, do you have an author's amendment? I do, Mr. Chair. I have two author's amendments. So we'll start with the first one, which is the A3. Is that in uh, members A3 is in your packets. Uh, all those in figure of the author's amendment A3 signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Amendment carries. Uh, Senator Nelson, do you have another author's amendment? I, I do. A5. Uh, yes, and that is the A5. Uh, A3 just uh, inserted the funding. Uh, that we'll be talking about A5 actually uh, includes something that this committee had not seen before, and that is that school floor plans uh, would be um, available to law enforcement or other emergency manage management officials serving the school district or charter school. Uh, those must be provided with a school floor plan. Uh, it shows doors, windows, stairways, room numbers, and other information useful to first responders. Thank you, Senator Nelson. All those in favor of the author's amendment A5, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Amendment carries. Senator Nelson, would you explain the purpose of Senate File 7? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, you will recall that last year our Safe Schools Initiative uh, was a comprehensive proposal, uh, and you will find much of that in this bill with you today. Uh, we adopted key provisions uh, that were important to uh, all, one of those being uh, an innovative provision that clarifies that schools may use the obligations <coughs> for safety-related equipment, those debt <coughs> obligations, or facility security uh, in using their safe schools revenue. So we'll talk uh, more about that, but that is one of the uh, important pieces of this bill as well. Um, you will recall that the Safe Schools Revenue Program is currently composed of all local levy. Uh, we have uh, proposed adding in this bill an additional $36 per student per year to the program. And that is on top of the levy, which is property taxes, although the bill before you makes it Safe Schools Aid. So it does not impact property taxes. So the safe schools aid is $36 per year per pupil, uh, making a total then for $72 a year for the program. This also, uh, as I said, does not increase local levies. Uh, the bill then also increases, as I said, the use for which school districts can use safe school revenue to include paying uh, bond obligations when they're used for uh, making the schools safer. Uh, in addition, uh, the bill encourages or adds that emergency communications like violence pre prevention and facility security are added to the list of eligible equipment that can be purchased through certificates of indebtedness or capital notes. You'll also note that the bill provides a $15 per year per pupil cooperative safe school levy for districts that are members of an intermediate district and a 10 year uh, per pupil safe school aid payment to districts that are members of other types of cooperatives. Uh, the bill also provides a minimum revenue, safe school revenue, of $25,000 for all districts, uh, no matter um, 
how many students they have. We want to make sure that every school receives at least $25,000. Uh, the bill also provides the $36 per year in pupil aid for safe schools to charter schools. As you know, they do not uh, benefit from property taxes. And yet we want to make sure that those schools, those children are in safe schools as well. The bill also includes the school-linked mental health services uh, delivered via telemedicine as being eligible for the safe school cost. And of course, it includes enhanced cybersecurity costs as being eligible safe school costs as well. And then, uh, and then as amended as well, it includes this, the uh, floor plans. Uh, the bill also directs the Commissioner of Education to annually report on the details of direct expenditures of safe school revenue. That is the nuts and bolts of the bill, uh, Mr. Chair, and we do have some testifiers. Uh, before we go to the testifiers, uh, thank you, Senator Nelson. Uh, Senator Anderson, do you have the A4 amendment? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to offer the A4 amendment. This is a... Uh, on page, page three, line 16 after C, uh, this is a $6 per pupil, pu per pupil in additional uh, fiscal year 20 aid for districts that are members of an intermediate district. Members, any questions for Senator Anderson on the A4 amendment? Mr. Chair. Senator Nelson. I would uh, accept this as a friendly amendment. This is an important addition, and I thank uh, Senator Anderson for bringing this forward. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Any questions? Seeing no questions, all those in favor of the A4 amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Amendment carries. Uh, Senator Nelson, we will now bring up your testifiers. Uh, Ms. Callahar, uh, Gary Amoroso, and uh, Ms. Thice, if you would uh, like to come up. Mr. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, uh, testifiers. Uh, please state your name for the record. Uh, Ms. Kelleher, if you'd like to go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Grace Kelleher, and I represent the Minnesota School Boards Association. And it is my pleasure to be up here sharing um, at least our optimistic outcomes for what this safe school bill needs to be. And there were a lot of pivotal pieces we had sort of coming together at the end of session. And that truly address school districts' needs. And let me just remind you of a few of them. Cybersecurity was a Senator Weger bill, and it is something on our mind constantly. Uh, the $25,000 minimum on aid makes sense. If you're only getting $5,000, your security in your school district is not going to be even comparable. The expansion of how we use bonds for communication equipment as well as uh, security-related equipment is a good change. And uh, we're excited about the school mental, linked mental health piece. It was a piece we lobbied on a lot last year, and we are hearing more and more from our school board members around the state about the importance of offering mental health support. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Armoroso. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, fully uh, in favor of this bill, uh, representing the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, uh, Gary Armoroso, Executive Director. Um, I don't want to re rephrase what uh, Ms. Keller just said, but I do want to just mention that uh, Senator Nelson has been a, a champion of this for a long time. When we had the tragedy last year in Florida, uh, the first person that actually contacted me was Senator Nelson. And I was out of state, and, and, and she asked me, what did school districts need? And we talked about a number of things, but said the most important thing we need is the flexibility. We need the resources, but then we need the flexibility to allow school districts to do what they believe is best within each of their individual districts. And I'm very pleased that what Senator Nelson presented last year and what she presents this year provides additional resources, but also provides additional uses for the dollars and lets the school districts make the decisions on what they feel is best for their individual districts. So I want to thank Senator Nelson for this bill and uh, fully support and hope that we uh, get something over the finish line this year in, uh, in the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tice. 
My name is uh, Danielle Tice, and I'm a principal special ed director, currently principal in New Dominion School, which is a school on the campus of Girard Academy in Austin, Minnesota. Um, I have 100 students in my building. All of them um, struggle with mental illness, many of whom have made threatening statements or um, had threatening thoughts in their minds. I wanted to have the opportunity to speak with you today about what I think is so important that we keep in mind for the young people in all of our schools. Safe schools, when we think about schools that are safe, we have to think about what does it mean truly to be safe. Safety is not tangible. It's not something someone can hand to you or tell you that you are safe. Safety is a sensation, it's a sense. We have a sense of whether or not we are safe. Children and adults have a sense of whether or not we are safe. When you think about places where you have felt safe, what did they look like? What did they sound like? And how did they feel to you? For most human beings, a sense of safety is established by the age of three through consistent care and nurturance through parents and guardians. For some, that underlying sense of safety is never established and be can become the impetus for thinking patterns and corresponding emotions that lead to maladaptive behavior patterns and mental health issues. Kids who've experienced trauma or have never felt safe or adequate tend to lack trust in adults and the spaces or settings that they manage, such as our schools. Trauma, mental health barriers, and a sense of internalized safety are interconnected. Every day a child brings three day things to school that no metal detector or security guard is going to stop. That is their mind and their hands. There are many times that items could be used to harm others within the grasp of all people in all places. It is the mind that determines how people perceive whether their environment is safe and the people around them are safe. It is the, the mind that determines whether I feel safe it is the mind that determines whether we feel we're at risk or in danger. It is the mind that determines how we react or we respond. Within this internal mental process lies the answer to school safety, to community safety, to all safety. Schools need resources to train their leaders and staff in trauma responsive practices. This paradigm can serve as the initial step and the establishment of a school culture that can obtain connectedness with every child it serves. When every child is connected, we can intervene effectively and they can learn to increase their tolerance of adult managed places, eventually acquiring the skills to follow adult guidance and welcome their support. For some children, school is the only platform where they can establish a true sense of safety. Ma'am, ma'am, yes. if you could kind of get into your closing remarks here. Yes. So we can move on. Yes, Thank so you. we must advocate for proactive mental health support for our children. We must make sure that these positions are funded, fully funded, and protected. Many times these are the positions that are the first to go. Our kids need them, our schools need them, our communities need them. Please advocate for the sustainment of these services in our schools. Thank you for your testimony. We do appreciate it. Members, any questions for the testifiers or for Senator Nelson? Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Nelson, could you, could you talk about um, lines 425 to 27? Senator Nelson. Could you, could you tell me a little bit more about it? I, I just don't know actually what that is. I'll find them here. Oh, yes. Um, Mr. Chair. And committee. Senator Nelson. Uh, yes. Uh, lines 424 through 427, um, well, actually 425 through 427, are the uh, lines that talk about, um, as I mentioned, that we will allow our current safe schools dollars. We're going to expand what they can be used for. So they can be used to pay down debt service 
on security enhancements. So currently, safe school dollars could not be used uh, as debt payment on bonds. Uh, this legislation allows them to do so for security enhancements. So if your school districts need single point entry, they need bulletproof glass, they need some other sort of security measures, and they choose to uh, bond for those costs, they can use their safe school revenue to pay the debt service on those bonds. That's what this particular language does. It's an innovative use. It's another use for those safe school dollars. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Nelson. Uh, Thank you for continuing to help focus us on this issue of safe and secure schools. Um, it is something we definitely all agree on, and, and I am certainly no exception. Um, the one concern that I have, and, and as you well know, this is an issue that I've been working on for a number of years. Uh, when you look at the safe schools, and I'll just say levy, because that's what it has been, language, and the allowable uses, um, and those are on page four, um, subdivision five, for those following along. Um, one of the items is under its, its subdivision, or it's section six and lines 4.14, to pay for costs for licensed school counselors, school nurses, social workers, school psychologists, and alcohol and, and chemical dependency counselors. I'm still crunching some of these numbers because I've been trying to look into this. Um, but I'm concerned that in practice, I understand that it is an allowable use, but I know a lot of people have said we need to increase the safe schools levy revenue here um, in order to make sure that we're increasing these professionals in our schools. But in practice, that's not what our schools have been using. And, and I apologize, I don't have those numbers finally crunched, but I'm, I'm working on getting those in, and getting them nailed down. But what I'm seeing is that it is a very small percentage of how these funds are actually used. And we can talk about local decision making and local control, and I agree and I understand that, but we also all know that this is a real deficiency in our schools in Minnesota, um, that we are, we rank at bottom in the country in terms of staffing up. And so while I am supportive of, of augmenting to, to school safety in this way, I think it's important that we be realistic, that if we really want to increase these actual professionals in our schools, that we have to be more intentional about it, and we need we need to do that too. We need to do, it's, it's both things. So um, I just, I just want to highlight that and say that I'm going to be coming back and, and I want to I keep having that conversation, but I want to just get that on the record that in my initial work on this, and, and I will get back with more concrete numbers, um, that just in practice, it, it's not achieving that goal that I think we all share. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, uh, and, and Senator Kent. Uh, I definitely uh, understand uh, your concerns, but I also believe that school districts know much better than we do here at the state of Minnesota about what is needed in their schools. Every school district is incredibly different, and uh, I feel much more comfortable allowing, putting more money into a formula like safe schools uh, revenue, and now it's new revenue, it's not a property tax, it's direct revenue. I feel that this is a much better way for schools to, if that's what they need to do, is um, hire more licensed school counselors or nurses or social workers or licensed school psychologists or licensed alcohol and chemical and dependency counselors to provide early response and, pro and preventive of the problems, as uh, the testifier mentioned. But I firmly believe that the school districts know what is best. Their locally elected school board members are accountable to the public in a much closer way than we are. And um, so while one school district may need to use their increased schools levy for more licensed school counselors, we want them to be able to do that. But to say that every school district must use their increased levy in that way, um, I would find uh, a problematic. Maybe they need to use it to pay down bonds so they can have bulletproof glass. We, I just don't know that, but I do trust uh, I do trust them uh, in that regard. So hopefully, as you m crunch the numbers, Senator Kent, you will see this is a significant investment in safe schools aid 
on top of the revenue or the le or safe schools uh, aid in on top of the safe school levy that these needs can be addressed but they can be addressed in a very locally uh, determined manner in uh, not a ratio but a way that actually fits each school district's needs best thank Ms. you senator nelson mr. Any other mr senator chair if i may just follow up um and i I, I don't want to give any impression that I am proposing ratios and mandating anything. Um, certainly my track record on this is in total local flexibility in how they handle this. But um, I think we need to be aware that if history is any indicator, um, that this just is not how these funds tend to be used. And I understand and I acknowledge that this is a different approach and, and there is that possibility. But I think it is also very important that we recognize that when it comes to that category of professionals, that Minnesota is literally last in the country in terms of how we invest in these professionals in our schools and bringing them and having those resources available for our students. And I think we we can no longer continue to just bury our heads in the sand and pretend that uh, what we've been doing or even a, a, a slight increase over what we've been doing is going to solve that problem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, Senator Nelson, the, Senator Kent has some good points. Maybe you mentioned this, but I, th I think we can kind of get at accountability, right? Where is accountability best establish that my sense is at the local level if if we're providing funds for specific uses for safety of the school is it not easier for them to be accountable at that level and then be flexible with their funds would that be your thought as far as that accountability piece Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Chamberlain. Yes, I do believe that the locals are more accountable. Um, and I do want to note that um, one of the innovations and reforms and added into this um, legislation is that the Commissioner of Education must annually report the details of how the safe schools aid, that includes levy and revenue, are spent. So uh, that way school districts will know, we will know, we'll see if, if perhaps uh, what Senator Kent is saying is true, is there a problem with that? But again, uh, it's very local. And, and I just want to add that um, Mr. Amoroso reminded me of that very, that day after, I think it was October 6th, that was a very uh, difficult time for us, for everyone, uh, after the shooting. In, in Florida and at a school, no less. And uh, I made two calls that morning and I can remember exactly what, where I was when I made those calls. And I, I will never forget what I was told. I called uh, law enforcement officials, uh, leading law enforcement, enforcement officials across the state. And uh, it was a little jarring to me what they said. They said, you know, you have to understand that uh, we need to make our schools safer. We need to make them safer, much like we did after 9-11, making our airports safer and our airplanes safer. Um, and I thought that was a little hard. They said, you need to harden the target, Carla. That's, that's what needs to be done here. And I think we realize that that is something we must do, those hard costs. Fortunately, they don't have to look like a prison. They can look just like the schools do today. They just have additional safety features that are built in. Uh, so that is important. But the second call I made was to Mr. Amoroso, who did tell me, yes, our schools need to be made secure, but I will never forget his plea. It was, it was please let us locally determine what those needs are. Do not give us a top-down solution from St. Paul that is going to be the same for every school. We're responsible. Each district knows its needs and students and buildings best. And if you just think about the great diversity in our state, whether it be in climate or terrain or diversity in students, all of these things are diversity that we embrace and celebrate. And we know that the school districts are not the same. Uh, some school districts have multiple buildings on one campus. Some have one building for K through 12, all in one building. They're very, very different. Some are very old buildings. Some are very new buildings. So the point is they all have students that need and must be able to attend a school that's safe and secure. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Any other questions? Senator Weger. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sarah Nelson. I am a co-author. I support the bill. I want to lend support though, to what Senator Kent had shared about the unacceptable rating for counselors. And at the same time, it's up to the school districts to determine the best mix of dollars <coughs> allocated. I believe the School Boards Association had documented over 200 million in needs and et cetera. We're not gonna have enough funds to do that, so they'll have to prioritize. We'll look at the reports that come back. So it's, it's a step and a needed step. I appreciate that it's being taken. Appreciate that it's early on in the session we're doing it. But at the same time, as we talk about safe schools, we have to remember there's other things that need to be looked at, at least discussed in other committees that have jurisdiction. And uh, without getting into a debate here, that's a part of the solution as well. So support this, look forward to those reports, and let's work together. Thank you, Senator Weger. Uh, we are running over time, so Senator Nelson, if you'd renew your motion. I would like to renew my motion that Senate file number seven be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. I did forget to mention the co-authors, and I want to thank Senator Weger for mentioning that. Uh, in addition to Senator Weger and myself, we have Senator Housley, Senator uh, Paul Anderson, and Senator Gazelka. So thank you, uh, members. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, Senate File 7, as amended, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Members, our next bill is Senate File 734. Welcome, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, Senate File 734 is also a bill that you might recall. Um, it is a suicide prevention uh, grants for training of our teachers. And I just will alert you to a number of handouts in your folder right attached to the bill so that uh, you are aware of that. Um, I will, I do have an author's amendment, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator and it is Nelson, the A1. would you like to move, your, move Senate File 734? Yes, I'd like to move uh, Senate File 734 be recommended to pass, laid over our, uh, for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Nelson, uh, you have an author's amendment? Yes, the, the A1. The A1 amendment is in the packets, is that correct? The A1 amendment is in the packet. Uh, all those in favor of the author's amendment, A1, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The amendment carries. Senator Nelson, would you explain uh, Senate File 734? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death in youth between the ages of 10 and 17. Uh, there was an underlying mental illness in 90% of the youth who have completed suicide. And in Minnesota, the suicide rate for 10 to 19 year olds is higher than the national rate. Our rate is seven per 100,000 compared to the state, the national average of 5.3. Uh, in, in Minnesota, 48 youth aged 10 to 19 died by suicide in 2016. And according to the 2016 Minnesota Department of Education Student Survey, 9,352 11th graders, 4,997 9th graders, and 4,967 8th grade public school students reported seriously considering suicide in the last year. Those numbers about make me cry. We should all be very concerned about those numbers. So right now, we have uh, teachers who are with our students are the number one in school variable when it comes to students. And we know that properly trained teachers can play an invaluable role in engaging youth with mental illness and reducing the risk of suicide. The Minnesota legislature passed a law in 2016 requiring all teachers to take one hour of evidence-based suicide prevention training as part of renewing their teacher's license. But we found there's been some problems. It's been difficult for schools to organize the teachers in order to provide that one hour training, particularly in greater Minnesota. And uh, some schools not knowing where to look to find evidence-based suicide prevention training, so they Google and find someone to come in and share their story. So this bill uh, is requesting uh, and providing funding 
for uh, evidence-based suicide prevention training for all teachers in Minnesota. Now, fortunately, we live in a digital world where so much is delivered online at a teacher's time and place of convenience. And that's what this bill will do. And by contracting with a company to provide this training to the entire state, of course, the cost comes down significantly. It also saves teachers time and also saves cost in travel costs. Rural districts particularly uh, will uh, benefit from this. So uh, I ask um, Mr. Uh, Sam uh, to uh, give further testimony but you can tell this is very hard to read those numbers about kids that are contemplating suicide. We cannot sit by members. You passed this bill last year. It was part of our safe schools bill that Governor Dayton vetoed. Uh, we cannot, we need to pass this. And so I'll, I'll turn it over to my testifier. Well, thank you, sir. And if you would like to go ahead and state your name and your occupation for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Sam Smith and I'm the Public Policy Coordinator for NAMI Minnesota. We're a nonprofit organization that advocates for people living with mental illnesses. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 734. Over 800 Minnesotans died by suicide last year and suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 10 and 17. This is a public health crisis and we need to recognize it as such. In 2016, the legislature just required teachers to have one hour of continuing education on suicide prevention training, and they have done so. However, as Senator Nelson noted, this effort has, needs additional support in order to be as effective as possible. Senate File 734 would provide for an online evidence-based training where teachers use role-playing scenarios to identify the signs of a mental health crisis, the best strategies to engage students with mental illnesses and when they should refer a student to a mental health professional. I would encourage you all to read the letters we have distributed where Minnesota schools praise the ease of using an online training to satisfy their suicide prevention training requirements. As one school noted, a teacher was even able to retake the training after they were approached by a student in need of more support. So as we know, properly trained teachers can play a vital role in engaging youth with mental illnesses and reducing the risk of suicide Investing in an online evidence-based suicide prevention training will make it far easier for, for teachers to have the tools to help Minnesota students and prevent suicide. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. I thank you, Mr. Smith, for your testimony. Members, any questions for Senator Nelson or for the Mr. Smith testifier? Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few years ago, we passed a bill requiring teachers that are renewing their five-year license that they had to have an hour of suicide training. So this definitely fits into that requirement. My question is, um, the amount um, of 480000 what does that actually uh, provide for? Is it an unlimited access to the program? Is it X amount of uh, sessions and then... I, am I correct in reading this that this is a one-time appropriation? If I could a have that answered, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So this Mr. funding Smith. will be used for a few different services, including providing unlimited access as many times as the teacher wants to take the training they can across the state. In addition to that, that will account for setup costs, rollout planning, and program stewardship to track positive outcomes, any stories or information coming from it. And because this is our first time doing it statewide, we thought trying it for two years and seeing how it goes before we fold it in would be the best best strategy. Follow-up, Senator Clausen. Just a follow-up, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So in two years, we could be back here looking at an additional cost to continue the program, correct? Mr. Smith. Mr. Chair, Senator Clausen, yes. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, this is hugely important, and I'm very supportive of what we're trying to do here. I do just have a question because, obviously, I'm new to this version of the committee, so I didn't have the, the uh, opportunity to hear this discussion last year. Um, 
I'm interested in understanding more about Cognito and uh, Senator Nelson, this is similar to a conversation we had last week about specifying a particular entity in legislation to provide a particular service. And I'm just wondering if Mr. Smith or you want to address um, what's, why this group? Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Kent. Uh, yes, um, this, uh, the language is uh, evidence-based suicide prevention training. So it isn't, it isn't preferable to, de to define a particular product. That's something we do try to avoid. However, um, I do know that uh, the amount of money requested here would provide for that statewide contract. There could be other vendors as well, which is another reason why this is uh, a one-time appropriation. Uh, we can definitely, uh, in the next budget cycle, look at, learn what, what, what did we learn here, um, what is working, uh, what isn't, is the money the uh, appropriate amount or not. Um, I would tell you though that uh, in the case of the Cognito suicide grants, it's interesting, there's a number of other states that are also doing this very same approach. And it, I, you know, it's great when Minnesota is the model. Once again, uh, just like with our uh, scholarships for pre-kindergarten, that Minnesota model is being um, emulated throughout the country. So is the uh, Cognito suicide grants as well. Highly effective. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Smith, you had mentioned earlier there were 800 suicides last year. Can you tell me the number that were in the K-12 or in that age group Mr. approximately? Smith. I think your statistics have that. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I could happily get it for you. I can you. give you that number again. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Jasinski, the Minnesota suicide rate for 10 to 19-year-olds, like, like I said, is higher than the national average. Ours is seven per 100,000. So I, I guess we would have to do the math there. And uh, the national average is 5.3 per 100,000. Uh, we have uh, just, for very rough estimates, we always estimate about a million students uh, in Minnesota schools. Thank you. Senator Clarkson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, based upon my previous questions, could we add a report to this so that we know where we might be in two years and if this is something that we'd want to uh, continue so we have some type of an evaluation that we could make a judgment on for future, future reference? Oh, thank you. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Clausen, um, I think that's a very good idea. And let's work on that. Um, I do know, um, I don't know, we do, we often look at results first, which is a very reputable way to look at what is the um, benefit and effect of particular programs. I don't know if they'd be able to do that for this or not, uh, but that's certainly one example, uh, looking at results first. And I look forward to working with you on that. I think that's a very good idea. Senator Nelson, uh, would you renew your motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I see one more member. Senator Weger, I'm sorry I missed you. Go ahead, Senator Weger. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Nelson, I believe the requirements for Tier 3 and Tier 4 licensed teachers, but this would be available to any teacher. And I'm also wondering about administrators or paras, you know, others that work with students that, and I, in looking at the letter from the social workers, organization and talked about the need for their training as well for administrators and uh, is that something that or a category that could be amended into this bill? Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you Mr. Chair and Senator Weger. I do believe that's something that we should look at. Uh, the first priority is teachers, those those uh, adults that have the closest relationship with every student um, and then I think it's a matter of <clears throat> how far uh, does the funding go? But I think those are very, uh, very good ideas to look at. So um, I think that's something we should consider as this bill goes forward. We'll, I'll need some more information uh, to do that. Members, other questions? Seeing none, Senator Nelson, you, you renew your motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to renew that Senate File 734 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Senate File 734 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Chair. Nelson. The next bill is Senate File 247, Senator Pratt. Thank you. 
Senator Pratt. Thank welcome. you. Welcome. Welcome to the committee. Thank would, you. Would you please move Senate File 247? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not on the committee, so I'd ask that somebody do move Senate oh, File yes, 247. Yes. Uh, Senator Anderson. Move the uh, Senate File 247 be uh, laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Pratt, uh, do you have any amendments before we start? Madam Chair, I do not. Okay, thank you. Um, Senator Pratt, if you could explain uh, the purpose of Senate File 247, and then we'll turn it over to your testifiers. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and committee. Uh, Senate File 247 uh, effectively clarifies and permits school nurses um, to handle uh, prescription drugs that are left over in a school at the end of the school year and the parents don't come and pick them up. Uh, this was part of last year's education policy omnibus bill uh, that had both bipartisan support and was at the time considered non-controversial once we worked through uh, uh, all of the different hurdles that we had to work through. Uh, the key to this is that it clarifies school nurses and schools have protocols for handling uh, drugs that um, these protocols address both controlled and non-controlled substances. It allows nurses to transport non-controlled substances and uh, requires them to request law enforcement uh, transport for controlled substances in accordance with federal law. Um, while I know my, uh, my explanation was riveting, uh, <laughs> I would like to uh, uh, really uh, allow uh, Ms. Jolie, not Jody, but Jolie with an L, um, Holland and uh, Susan Nokelby uh, testify on behalf of the bill. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Ms. Holland, please introduce yourself for the tape and continue. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Jolie Holland, and thank you for this opportunity and Senator Pratt for helping school nurses with a solution to a problem that is medication disposable, disposal. I'm the district school nurse for Howard Lake Waverly Winstead, and today I'm representing the School Nurse of Minnesota organization, and we support this bill. Medication disposal is a huge issue for school nurses. We prefer that parents pick up medications when they're done, and uh, we do uh, contact the parents and we send out notices and ask them at the end of the year to pick them up. But oftentimes parents forget and they don't come in and so these medications end up stockpiled in our offices. Current law doesn't allow school nurses to transport medications to a medication disposal facility if it's not prescribed to them. However, we should not be leaving medications in nurses' offices, particularly over the summer months and particularly controlled substances. Uh, we would like to be able to dispose of leftover medications and we believe that this piece of legislation will do that. The School Nurse Organization of Minnesota would be eager to help the school boards and the superintendents when developing policies and procedures for the collection and transport of these medications and unclaimed medications. So thank you, Madam Chair and committee members and Senator Pratt for your intention uh, to this important legislation for school nurses community and uh, safety. Thank you, Ms. Holland. And uh, who is your next testifier? My name is Sue Knuckleby, Madam Chair. Yes, welcome to the committee. Continue. And thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee and Senator Pratt for coming back once again to help us with this. It may seem like a minor thing, but as we work in an educational facility rather than a hospital or a healthcare facility, they all have their procedures out. We don't have that. So we're kind of the hidden uh, health care agency within the educational system. Um, we do, like jo Ms. Jolie Holland said, that we do try to get those medications back to the parents. Uh, it doesn't always work, unfortunately. So anyway, we do need a safe place to get rid of these medications. I was uh, a school nurse administrator for a school district in which uh, one of our health offices was broken into during the summer. So I know how urgent that is. Um, currently, I'm the school nurse at West Education Center, which is a a school within District 287. So we have a lot of medications, um, controlled substances, and psychotropic su substances for kids. And then also I am the past president of School Nurse Organization of Minnesota and member of the Legislative Committee. So I hope that you consider this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pratt. 
Any final comments? Uh, or Madam excuse Chair. me, ma uh, excuse me, Senator Pratt. I should see if we have any committee comments first. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just very briefly, Senator Pratt, thank you for sticking with this issue. I know you all worked through a lot of details, and this did definitely have bipartisan support in the Education Policy Committee mm -hmm. last year. So I just wanted to make that statement and thank you for that. Thank you. Any other comments, members? Uh, Senator Weger. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Pratt and testifiers, well done. Would you like an amendment that makes this effective the day following enactment? Yeah, if it, then it'll be ready uh, for this spring. Miss, right? excuse me. <laughs> Miss, uh, the, the answer has been given. Senator Pratt, I need to hear from you <laughs> on this. Uh, Got too excited. Senator Weger, this is going to be in the uh, omnibus bill, and, and so uh, well, I hope it'll be in the omnibus bill, and so uh, I think that's for you and, and Senator Nelson to work out. Uh, I would certainly be open. Uh, to that, but uh, uh, certainly I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let the committee decide what the right uh, what the right enactment date is. Thank you very much, Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Pratt. I know there have been a lot of technical issues uh, in, in terms of sort of public safety issues, so this is probably a slightly more complicated question than it might seem. So I'm willing to help work and navigate that as well as we make a decision before we come up with an omnibus Th bill. Thank you, Senator Kent. So noted. Um, Senator Pratt renews his motion that Senate File 247. Senator Anderson. Oh, Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson removes the motion. Oh, yes. Senator Anderson renews his motion that Senate File 247 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. All those in favor? Passed. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, who would like to move Senator Pratt's bill, Senate File 389? Senator Weger, move Senate File 389 uh, be uh, referred to Judiciary and Public Safety Finance and Policy. Uh, Senator Pratt, to your bill, Senate File 389. What is it? Why is it important? And what are you going to do? <laughs> Those are, all big, those are all big questions. You've set a high standard. Uh, <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair and Committee, uh, Senate File 389 um, is, an, is, is a change to uh, how schools execute on fire drills. Uh, this was part of last year's uh, education policy omnibus bill as well. And what it does is basically say that uh, we provide local control to permissively decide whether one of the five mandated uh, fire drills can be a stay-in-place drill. Uh, we haven't had a fire in Minnesota, or I'm sorry, we haven't had a fire death of, of more than 10 students, as far as I could tell, uh, in 61 years. But yet we know that our schools are facing, uh, we want our kids to be safe in case of fire, but we also know that uh, they're facing other challenges that they didn't face in 1958. Uh, I wish I could take credit for this bill, but uh, Superintendent Matt Helgerson uh, came up with the idea, and uh, Madam Chair, if it's okay, I would uh, let Superintendent Helgerson maybe uh, fill in the important details uh, about why it's important. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the tape. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I am Matt Helgerson, Superintendent of Jordan Public Schools, and uh, I'd like to thank Senator Pratt for authoring this bill both last year and this year, and also MASA and MSBA for endorsing this bill. Um, obviously, I'm here today presenting on behalf of school districts and children across the state. While unfortunate, we are faced with, a proact with proactively handling the issue of school safety. In the wake of school shooting tragedies which have occurred across the nation over the past 25 years, an area of concern has come to the forefront. In several of the shootings, it's been reported the assailant pulled the fire alarm or created a small fire with smoke to activate the alarm and thus create chaos. The goal of the assailant is to cause people to leave the classroom areas and exit the building where the assailant is then waiting and ready to use a gun to shoot as many people as possible. This issue first caught my attention after reviewing our own safety, school safety protocol with the Minnesota Department of Homeland Security School Safety Division, whom we invited in, along with local law enforcement. Shortly after we met with these groups, we revised our local emergency action plan to establish what we call a lockdown with options it's a protocol where we implemented run, hide, and fight, which is a change from the shelter in place uh, protocol of the past. As part of the plan, staff and students were instructed to stop and assess each situation prior 
to immediately leaving the classroom and building for a fire alarm. We informed families, students, and um, in families, we informed families, staff, and students of this change. And I received a call and visit shortly thereafter from our, our fire marshal. I was instructed to end this new practice immediately or I would be cited and he would shut our district down. That's a direct quote. We were told that we were needed to practice a normal, traditional fire drill within 24 hours or this would occur. The fire marshal then subsequently showed me the law that read that the occupants were to quit the premises immediately. That's what the, uh, the current statute says. That struck me as being antiquated simply because modern school buildings are equipped with sprinkler systems and as Senator Pratt mentioned, it's extremely rare to see a school fire that results in injury or death. While I argued at the time with the fire marshal, I didn't push the issue until the Parkland shooting where it was reported in that situation that the fire alarm was pulled. And I began exploring options to amend the law and made some calls um, to our school boards association, Senator Pratt and MASA. I feel that in 2019, um, unfortunately, students are much more likely to be killed due to a school shooter than a school fire. In my opinion, we must equip staff and students with options as it relates to school emergency plans. The best plan is to teach our students and staff to assess the situation after our alarm sounds. Like in the classroom, we want to create an atmosphere where students think critically and can solve problems. In this case, if they can see or smell smoke or see or feel fire, then exiting the building is likely and I say likely, the best option. If fire or smoke isn't observed, sheltering in place may be the best option until the situation changes or further instruction is given. It's important that we allow our students and staff this option in hopes of avoiding a situation where a shooter has activated the alarm in order to cause people to immediately evacuate and potentially walk into a more dangerous situation where an active shooter is waiting. Thus, that lockdown with options which is complemented by the alternative fire drill um, plan, I believe is the best method. I'd like to thank you for your time and I would be happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Halgerson. Any questions, members? Madam Chair, if I might. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, in your packets, member, you should, you should have a letter from Superintendent Lindholm uh, from Prequat Schools. Um, Superintendent Halgerson touched on a very important point in that Last year, we uh, met with the Fire Marshals Association and a number of other folks, including uh, our local Scott County Fire Marshal. Um, I think, in, in, in my opinion, this represents what was a compromise uh, among the parties. I can't say that they were exactly uh, enamored with it. They would like us to quit the building in all fire drills, but uh, I, I felt like we had a good compromise, so I won't say it's not non-controversial. Um, but I think it's, it's a, good, uh, a good compromise in order to say that we're going to allow the, the superintendent who must uh, consult with his local fire department and uh, his local uh, police department in order to come up with these rules um, as, a, as a kind of a, a good middle ground. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, any final comments then? Okay. Uh, members? Uh, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a thank you, Senator Pratt. This is something that goes back about 20 years that uh, high school principals were advocating for, drill in place so we wouldn't have to evacuate the uh, building and perhaps put students in a greater danger than being present in a, a fire situation. And most uh, buildings, or all buildings, I think now are required to be sprinklered, and we have uh, taken great, great strides in... Uh, Oh, barriers within buildings, and so uh, really appreciate your work in this. Just a, another little comment. Chris Lindholm was a student at Rosemont High School when I was there as principal. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, uh, Senator Clausen. Turned out very well. Senator Clausen, you don't look that old. <laughs> uh, any further comments, Senator Jasinski? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Pratt. Thank you for this bill. It's a good common sense bill. I managed department buildings for about 18, well, actually 28 years, and we implemented this in a lot of uh, senior buildings uh, that because, again, because sprinkler systems, detection systems, it made much more sense. And, and I remember being a sixth and seventh grader and all the disruption a, a fire drill would cause, a lot of lost time in the classrooms, and this just makes a lot more sense. So thank you, Senator Pratt, for bringing it forward. It's a good common sense bill that will keep students safe and, and continue to be productive in the classroom. So thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, members. Um, I'll move that uh, Senate File 389 be recommended to pass and re referred to Judiciary and Public Safety Finance and Policy. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. You're on your way to Judiciary, you. Senator Pratt. Uh, Senator Pratt, you get extra points because you made up time on our agenda <laughs> as well. Uh, and with that time, very importantly, I'd like to introduce, uh, we have four students who are shadowing some senators today. They are with FCCLA, our uh, next uh, group of legislative leaders. I see five red jackets. If they would take just a moment to stand up, tell us your name and where you're from. Stand up quickly. Tell us your name. Thank you. Thank you. Lillian? Uh, I'm Lillian Olson. I'm from Purdue. Four hour drive, folks, to get here today. I'm Anna Hoff. I'm from Cassie Angel. Um, I'm Sophia Patel. I'm from Springfield. Thank you. Thank you very much for spending time uh, with your government today. All right, members. Our next bill is Senator Icorn's Senate File 580. Senator Icorn, please uh, move Senate File 580 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Madam Chair, I'd like to move Senate File 580 to be laid over for possible inclusion. Terrific. Senator Icorn, uh, tell us what Senate File 580 is about, um, and uh, also then we'll introduce your testifiers. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate File uh, 580 is like some of the other bills I've carried in, in the Education Committee this year to provide some additional fairness so that all students end up having the same opportunities. Uh, what this does is, is it proposes to somewhat expand the non-public pupil aid program so that non-public elementary school students, as well as uh, those students at our American Indian tribal schools are eligible to receive guidance and counseling services uh, and that would be through the public school districts and as you already know generally the the state doesn't fund non-public schools uh, but however some aid is provided to non-public schools uh, to students through public school districts through for transportation for health for textbooks and a few other things and this legislation would extend that uh, for this new option for non-public schools and again for our American Indian tribal students um, and it'll uh, and it increases and with that increased appropriation um, we we did we did increase the appropriation so that we don't have an unfunded mandate on our public school folks we want this to be budget neutral for our for our public schools but we want all students again like I said to be on that same playing field to be able to all receive those same services so that all, all of our students needs throughout Minnesota can be taken care of regardless of where they choose to go to school. So that's the gist of the bill and I can hand it over to the testifier. Thank you, Senator Icorn. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the tape and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Tim Benz. I'm the president of the Minnesota Independent School Forum. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my, again, my name is Tim Benz. I'm president of the Minnesota Independent School Forum. Founded in 1976, we are the largest statewide organization representing the non-public schools of Minnesota. Uh, for context, um, I also have the privilege of serving as the chair of the Minnesota Non-Public Education Council through the Minnesota Department of Education as well. There are approximately 470 non-public schools in the state of Minnesota educating about 65,000 students overall. The average size of a non-public school is about 138 students. Um, on behalf of our statewide membership, I am here to support Senate File 580. Currently, guidance and counseling services are provided to students in grades 7 through 12 via the Minnesota Non-Public Pupil Aids legislation. However, students in the elementary grades are not eligible for guidance and counseling services. This proposed modification and expansion of this program will ensure equitable access to non-public students in the elementary grades. As you know and as we have heard today, mental health challenges for students continues to increase. We hear with greater frequency school leaders and educators seeing younger students with more complex needs, increased anxiety, stressors at home, and isolation. All of this makes learning for the student a real challenge. A key outcome of this legislation is the opportunity for early identification and intervention of potential mental and emotional issues, academic, personal, or social, that could be addressed much earlier than grade seven. We believe the investment early on will result in potential greater savings and better outcomes down the road for the students. Thank you to Senator Eichhorn 
for sponsoring this bill and to the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 580. I welcome any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Benz. Any comments or questions from members? Senator Eichhorn, uh, you get the award for the fastest bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Senator Chair. Senator Eichhorn uh, renews his motion that 580 be laid on the table for possible inclusion with the omnibus bill. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Senator Bingham, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that Senator Bingham's bill, Senate File 177, be recommended to pass and referred to Judiciary and Public Safety Finance and Policy. Senator Bingham, do you have an amendment today? Yes, Madam Chair, I do have an author's amendment, the A3 amendment. Members, do you have the A3? Uh, Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to uh, move the A3 amendment as an author's amendment for Senator Bigham. All those in favor of the author's amendment uh, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Adopted. Uh, Senator Bingham, to your bill is amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much for hearing Senate File 177 in committee today and allowing the opportunity to have this discussion on the need for school threat assessment teams. I'd also like to thank my co-authors, um, Senator Weger, Abler, Anderson, and of course, uh, you, Madam Chair. Uh, testifiers on the bill, Cottage Grove Police Department Captain Randy McAllister and Dr. Chris Kleinen will describe the best practices and the effectiveness of the school threat assessment teams, but I wanted to briefly explain why and what they are for the committee and um, Minnesotans watching today. After the Parkland shooting, it was apparent that there was a lack of communication between the school that had expelled the student and law enforcement that was looking into the individual's behavior. Senate file 177 requires a school board to adopt a safety assessment policy and establish a safety assessment team consistent with the school board's crisis management policy and guidance provided by the school safety center. Further, the legislation provides that members of the safety assessment team include to the extent practical school officials with expertise in counseling, school administration, students with disabilities, and law enforcement. Um, a safety assessment team may serve more than one school. And finally, the Senate file 177 appropriates 300,000 for training and training programming uh, of, of school districts and threat assessment teams. I am thankful for the support of the Minnesota Sheriff's Association, the Minnesota Police Chiefs Association, and the Rochester School District support for this very important school safety policy. And also the author's amendment that was adopted um, was um, worked with uh, with NAMI who um, remain neutral on the bill. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn this over to the testifiers. Thank you, Senator Bingham. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the tape and continue. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Randy McAllister. I'm a captain with Kaiser Grove Police Department. And uh, probably more importantly in terms of this bill, uh, I am one of the first 24 certified threat managers in the country through the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. So that's uh, sort of in my wheelhouse. Um, so I want to start by uh, talking a little bit about uh, why we're here. Uh, in 1999, Littleton, Colorado, 15 dead, 21 injured. 2003, Cold Spring, Minnesota, two dead. 2005, Red Lake, Minnesota, 10 dead, seven injured. 2012, Newtown, Connecticut, 28 dead, two injured and 2018, Parkland, Florida, 17 dead and 17 injured. These cases represent just a tiny fraction of K-12 uh, school violence in the United States, uh, shooting or otherwise. But the thing they all share in common is that they're all potentially preventable. What could have prevented them is a robust school threat assessment process and team. In fact, in most of the recent cases since Newtown, uh, when a school shooting happens that, happens, that jurisdiction typically responds after the fact by establishing a threat assessment program. The obvious question is why do we wait until after a tragedy to do this? Uh, how do we tell the parents of a murdered child that we had the tools all along to prevent that murder, uh, but instead chose a tactic of hope, hoping violence wouldn't visit our schools? According to, the, to a recent FBI study, the number of mass shootings has increased over the past 13 years. Uh, in response to the increase in mass shootings, the FBI uh, put together a, a blue ribbon panel in 2015 and to look at all the uh, possible uh, violence prevention uh, tactics out there, and they found that, quote, by far the most valuable prevention strategy identified 
was a threat assessment and management team, unquote. Likewise, the U.S. Department of Education has recommended threat assessment teams as a best practice since 2002, 17 years ago. Threat assessment is a process and way of identifying, assessing, and managing the risk of future violence. It helps different disciplines connect the dots and avoid what we saw in Parkland, Florida last year. It is evidence-based and it has become widely accepted as a standard of care for targeted violence prevention. Uh, it is not punitive in nature, uh, nor is it profiling. In fact, it's the opposite of profiling. Uh, profiling looks at demographics to predict crime. Threat assessment, on the other hand, looks at behaviors that are observable. Um, identified through years of research to assess if somebody is on a pathway to violence. Uh, significantly, it also provides a systematic way of looking at all threats and threatening behaviors to determine which ones actually pose a threat of violence. If a school does not have a multidisciplinary threat assessment team to do this, then they are probably just guessing in many cases. Threat assessment can be used for the entire gamut of violence or threatening behaviors and is not limited to preventing school shooters. For example, it can be used to address bullying, to deal with dating violence and stalking, or to address non-student threats such as staff or outsiders. Additionally, it can help the school as a workplace avoid violence uh, which OSHA has been fining for and plaintiff's attorneys have been successfully suing for in just the past few years. The goal with threat assessment is to identify these people and to get them help to prevent future acts of violence. It, at its very core, it attempts to intervene with people on the path to violence and get them back on a healthy path. It's restorative and not punitive. In looking at some of the research on school shootings, we find that 95 percent of these school attackers are in fact current students, so they have easy access to the schools. The other 5% are previous students, like the Parkland shooter last year. In these situations, uh, adding expensive physical security measures such as cameras and locked doors is going to, going to do very little to stop the attack. Uh, it may mitigate it, but it will not stop it. We are aware of groups and people who disagree with threat assessment. Uh, respectfully, let me assure you that these positions are largely based on misunderstandings of what threat assessment is and is not. Perhaps the best way to illustrate this is by listing some of the groups that have worked through the issues around violence prevention, such as data privacy, ADA, bias, FERP, and HIPAA, and still endorse threat assessment. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education considers it a best practice. The National Association of School Psychologists considers it a best practice in a non-stigmatizing way to uh, prevent violence, unlike uh, zero tolerance policies and other approaches. The American Psychological Association in a white paper on gun, gun violence in America considers behavioral threat assessment a best practice. Uh, multiple law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, Virginia's K-12 threat assessment model, which our bill is based on, is considered an evidence-based best practice by the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the final report of the Federal Commission on School Safety, just released in December, uh, mentions uh, threat assessment is an important component of school safety. Uh, and then finally, the National Association of Attorneys General um, have uh, called for all schools and colleges to implement threat assessment programs across the country. Since implementing, implementing the statewide K-12 threat assessment mandate in 2013, the Commonwealth of Virginia has studied the results. What researchers found is that threat, assessments prog threat assessment programs lower rates of suspension and expulsions, they decrease incidents of bullying, they increase reporting from students when they are, are concerned about a classmate. They create school climates where students feel safe so they can focus on education. They eliminate disciplinary disparities between minority and white students. And I think that's a really important thing, so I'll say it again. The uh, threat assessment programs eliminate bias and disciplinary sanctions for minority students. Uh, they also found that um, threat assessment reduces disciplinary outcomes for special education kids. Uh, which we don't see with, uh, without threat assessment programs. So, Madam Chair and committee members, uh, I ask you to support uh, Senate File 177, which would fund model policies and guidelines for threat assessment programs and teams and provide standardized training at, to uh, all public school districts in the state. Uh, this bill is not a Cadillac model. Uh, it's a Chevy or a Ford, depending on your flavor. Um, as such, it establishes some foundational building blocks for a best practice threat assessment program, yet provides enough flexibility for districts to implement a program that works best in their respective environments and locations. If widely uh, and properly implemented, a statewide threat assessment program can prevent acts of targeted violence and improve our school cultures. I ask you to join the states of Virginia, Connecticut, and Florida in requiring threat assessment so we can take real 
concrete steps to make our schools uh, safer for students, staff, and teachers. Uh, and I will also just add to this uh, the, the liability landscape just in the last three years that's changed dramatically. And um, not having threat assessment programs increases the school district's liability. Um, we see that in case law. We see that with Parkland and, and all the lawsuits that are going on now um, and in, in certain states' laws that have been passed elsewhere. So with that, we'll pass it on. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Dr. Christine Keenlan. I'm a forensic psychologist, and I also have a private practice consulting in threat management, primarily with corporations, colleges, and a few high schools in Minnesota. Um, I am also a mother, and I have two daughters attending Minneapolis Public Schools, and like all parents, I want safe schools. <clears throat> High school students have shared with me that they hear jokes or nonchalant comments about school shootings on nearly a daily basis. I think many are trying to cope with the high profile cases of school shootings in the news. The reality for many students, parents, and school staff today is an undertone of fear in anticipation of school violence. This is a distraction from the real work, education. It is an enormous challenge for schools to sort out the students who truly are at risk of future violence. Some students talk about violence or exhibit concerning behaviors but have no intent to act. They might be seeking attention or expressing frustration, anger, fear, or distress. Persons who pose a higher risk of school violence may exhibit fixation on violence or idolization of prior school shooters, feelings of resentment or a grudge, serious mental health issues like paranoia or depression, feelings of rejection or loss, or feeling desperate and unable to cope. In the most serious cases, the, the individual of concern has acquired guns or weapons and has made plans or taken steps to carry out violence. These cases are in an, an imminent risk and should be viewed as a crisis. Uh, while mass shootings gain a lot of attention and are catastrophic, they are relatively infrequent. Uh, there are more common areas of violence that threat assessment teams address, including serious bullying that is persistent and causes fear for safety, stalking or repeated harassment, teen dating violence or domestic violence, sexual assault, and fighting and other aggression. The Threat assessment team has a number of roles, and one is promoting a culture of safe schools with a policy that all threatening or violent behavior will be investigated and there may be interventions. This is different from the zero tolerance rules that fail to consider the context and intent behind the student's behavior. The focus is not solely threats by students. The threat assessment team also focuses on safety for students or staff who are threatened by other staff, family, ex-partners, or others outside of the school. School employees are a valuable resource and we want to keep them safe. Schools are workplaces and experience the same types of workplace violence issues that any other workplace may experience. In 2011, national standards for workplace violence prevention were published recommending threat management teams. Human resources and employment attorneys typically become involved if it is an employee threat situation. Um, the threat assessment team process, uh, for it to be effective, requires training um, about a structured and systematic process uh, to assess potential school violence. The multidisciplinary threat assessment team collects information from various sources and thus can connect the dots and put the picture together about um, whether someone may uh, present as a more serious risk. The assessment examines the, the interaction between the subject, the potential target, the environment, and potential triggers. Each case is unique 
and I want to emphasize that an individualized intervention plan is developed. As the school shooting in Parkland, Florida highlights, removal of the concerning person from the school does not necessarily remove the threat. The threat assessment team can engage in long-term monitoring of more concerning cases. The threat assessment team may need to rely on external professionals for consultation in more serious cases. Sometimes consultation with an external mental health professional is needed uh, because mental health or disability issues are reasonably believed to be causing or contributing to threatening behaviors or violence. The mental health evaluation should be balanced considering violence risk factors, but also protective factors. What does the individual have going for them in their life that may deter them from acting out violently? The focus is putting supports in place and early intervention to prevent the violence. When someone intends to carry out violence or there is imminent danger, law enforcement intervention is needed to keep the school safe. Law enforcement can also help address threats from outside the school. Legal cons consultation can protect the rights of students and employees. I do uh, want to reiterate that the process is behavioral and does not profile or discriminate. In 2013, Virginia became the first state to mandate student threat assessment in public schools. A subsequent study of Virginia schools by Dewey Cornell and <laughs> co-authors found that race and gender were not significantly associated with serious threat determinations and there were no racial or ethnic differences in disciplinary outcomes. While some students may be placed on suspension uh, due to their threatening or violent behaviors or as the evaluation is taking place, in most cases, expulsions can be avoided. There are many interventions that can occur within the school setting, but some cases require referral to outside mental health resources or social services. Madam Chair, and committee members, I ask for your support of this bill so that a sustainable school threat management process can be developed that will improve the overall safety and well-being of our Minnesota school communities. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Bingham, do you have other testifiers today? I do not. Okay. Is there anyone else in the, I have two on my sheet here. Uh, Dr. Chris? Keeneland. Keeneland, mm -hmm. that was you, all right, and then I have uh, Grace Kelleher, Minnesota, so Minnesota School Board Association. Oh, excuse me. Uh, are these questions uh, with the testifiers who just uh, completed? General? All right, do you want to wait till after this last testifier? All right, Senator Jasinski, can you wait till after Mr. Uh, Ms. Kelleher for your question? I, I didn't have one. Oh, Swadzinski, I got my Zinskis mixed up. <laughs> Senator Swadzinski, can you wait? All right, thank you so much. Uh, what an honor to be <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Kelleher, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the tape. And we, we could let uh, Senator Bingham slide in there, that'd be important. Thank you. Madam Chairman and members, my name is Grace Kelleher and I represent the Minnesota School Boards Association. We're here today on Senate File 177. Threat assessments have been a piece the last couple of years here at the Capitol, so we spent quite a bit of time on these issues. It is MSBA's desire to treat, to reduce threats. It's laudable, but it, oh, excuse me, Senator Bingham's um, desire to reduce threats is laudable. But it must be done in a manner that works, that doesn't create other problems, that doesn't duplicate what is already in place and can be paid for. As we researched this bill in particular, we came up um, with some implementation concerns. And let me just roll those things out to you. The bill says the team must act when the behavior may pose a threat. What is the standard to be applied? Beyond a reasonable doubt? reasonable suspicion, more likely than not, probable cause, and at what level does the school safety assessment team go into action? Moving on, we hope the legislature should be prepared to pay the cost of implementation in this bill. 
The teams would require training and compensation. Guidance materials would have to be developed, produced, distributed, and updated. And staff time for training would be required. We should not underestimate the costs for this bill. And essentially, we're asking school officials to receive the threat assessment training akin to law enforcement. Similarly, the bill author should clarify when district and district employees would be criminally or civilly liable if they fail to detect to prevent harm from a threat. Liability exposure at this magnitude would certainly affect our district's cost and ability to obtain comprehensive general liability coverage. And lastly, I want to share, we had a wonderful article from student counseling that was handed out with the materials. I direct members down to uh, the first column there at the bottom. Here's what they have to say. There is no easy formula or profile of risk factors that accurately determines the next school shooter. In fact, most students who display multiple risk factors will never become school shooters. And some who present a real threat do not demonstrate a, pres a prescribed level of risk. The use of profiling behaviors and risk factors against a set of criteria is not recommended because it may misidentify youth and in doing so cause more harm than good. Presently, school districts do have these threat uh, assessments. Excuse me, Ms. Keller, that is very, um, th those are very significant words. Could you uh, point us to that? I, I'm not seeing it in my packet here. Where, where is that? I'm not that? demonstrating where this might be, but it is right here on the front cover of school counseling. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Members, uh, important to, to refer to. Thank you. Ms. Kelher, continue. Presently, the law does prescribe a crisis management policy. It's statute 121A.031. And in that, we are, uh, our responsibility is for potential crisis situations in our school districts. Uh, the model policy created here was an originally a collaborative effect between the Minnesota Department of Education, the Division of Compliance and Assistance, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, and the School Boards Association. So presently across the state, school districts can already do this, and many of them do without a law change at all, but through this uh, piece in front of us. We would hope the committee thinks long and hard about uh, where they want to uh, ensure this happens and how long this might take to uh, actually train people ready to make those tough decisions going forward. With that, Madam Chair, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kelleher. Uh, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Bingham. Uh, Senator, uh, Ms. Kelleher touched on a few things here. I agree, it's very laudable, but I think we can all understand it's, I mean, if we could, you know, go in there and find one or two or five or ten things, say, whoa, we got something here and we really know with 95% confidence we're going to pull something out of here that's going to prevent some trouble, uh, you know, what is that confidence, what, what level of confidence do we have or where should we draw that line? Uh, to say, well, is it 70% confidence level that we're, we're good with or 60 or 80 or 90 before we uh, start intervening and doing all these things for a child? I think it's very important to think along these lines and uh, always be aware of these issues. But uh, Ms. Keller raises some uh, big concerns. This is a gray area in many respects. And it's difficult to find a child, as the studies show, right? Um, it's uh, some other way. It really does cause a problem in the end, may demonstrate nothing of the sort during the time. So I guess one quick question is, if you get a child like this, does it go in a record? And is that record kept and will be a permanent part of a record, just as, a, as an example? You, know, you find a child, they have, they're exhibiting five or ten of these traits, you do the intervention. Uh, what's recordable, what's permanent, and what would not be. And what happens to that uh, in, in the end? Thank you. 
Senator Bingham. Madam Chair, before I turn um, the, the, I'm going to say something and then I'm going to have one of my, ask one of my testifiers, uh, Captain McAllister, to respond. I will say that a lot of the concerns that Ms. Kelleher has addressed or brought up were all addressed in the testimony that you heard. There is funding in the bill um, and there's plenty of studies and data that show that this actually um, is a preferred model to zero tolerance. Um, which would increase expulsion, which would increase placement in an alternative learning center, um, increase just removal out of a school and out of, out of the, the school community. So with that, I'm going to ask Captain McAllister to respond. Captain McAllister. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Chamberlain. Um, good questions and questions that need to be asked. Um, I would point out that the, the title of the paper that uh, Ms. Kelleher just uh, referenced, the profiling, the title is Threat Assessment, an Essential Component of a Comprehensive Safe School Program. Um, she was mentioning profiling, and uh, we testified this is not profiling. It's com complete opposite of profiling. Um, there's no profile of a school shooter. The U.S. Secret Service and Department of Education uh, determined that um, and published it in 2002 with their, their landmark study. Um, so we don't look at profiles. We look at behaviors. And threat assessment is much like going to your cardiologist. Um, I think this kind of helps sort of show what, it, what threat assessment is like. Your cardiologist can list off all your risk factors for having a heart attack in the next five years, but he can't predict that you will be that one to have a heart attack. If your cardiologist has 10 patients exactly like you with the same risk factors, uh, he may or sh she may be able to accurately say five out of 10 of you will have a heart attack in the next five years. But he or she cannot say which one of you will have that. And that's what threat assessment is very similar to that. We look at risk factors, and much like cardiology, where you can take some pills, get some treatments, you reduce the risk of heart, heart attacks like we've done in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, we can do the same thing with threat assessment. We can reduce the risk of violence. So um, again, it's protective. It's therapeutic. Um, the goal isn't to arrest people. Uh, in fact, that's an absolute last resort, typically, unless we get a call that a kid's on his way to school with a gun, then obviously law enforcement probably takes the lead on that. Um, but so, and then in, in terms of the um, liability <coughs> issues, the, the case law is out there. Um, people are getting sued, school districts are getting sued because they don't have good threat assessment programs, yeah. because there's a legal um, idea of foreseeability. Um, and violence, targeted violence has become a foreseeable uh, risk, if you will, because of the research. And when you don't protect from that foreseeable risk, whether it's a school or a workplace, then you increase your risk of being sued successfully for large amounts of money. Thank, thank you. Madam Chair, I'll follow up. Senator Chamberlain. Thank you. So I, I appreciate that, but there's some, sometimes in here, as, as in law enforcement, uh, the more you talk, the more you tend to generate, stir up the stuff at the bottom of the pond and, and create more questions. And uh, so we've got another problem here. Uh, the cardiology issue I'll come to in a second. <laughs> but but uh, the, my question wasn't answered, Senator Bingham. If you find a kid and, and uh, they fit some, we don't use a profile, they fit some risk profile, well, we have to, risk profile, for lack That's of a better term. And um, uh, things are there. You intervene and you do things. There's data recorded. There's, there's uh, therapy. There's whatever it might be. Does that go into a, uh, does that get written down, put into a file, become a record, become a permanent record, and then what goes on with that child in the end? And, and, and that's question one. What happens to that data? Uh, what do we do with it? What, how does that impact the kid who may invent, eventually, heck, I think all of us in this room, anybody could have been a, considered a threat at some time in their life if they're a kid, right? You get angry uh, for whatever reason, right? <clears throat> Throw your milk across the room at somebody. But uh, the cardiology thing I do, uh, officer, that, uh, that if, you're, if you have a threat, if you are at risk of a heart attack, uh, then you can take on to yourself that risk and say, well, I'll do something or I won't. In a threat assessment and you identify a child as a having certain risk factors, well, now it doesn't become that child's decision to say, well, I'll ignore that. The system 
comes in <coughs> and starts doing things. Again, this is very laudable, but I think we have to be very careful. Uh, some of the comments here in the last few weeks and months, uh, I've seen a sci-fi flick about Minority Report. You had a pre-crime unit. Well, that can create a lot of trouble. Now, that's fiction, but we seem to be <laughs> clo rapidly closing in on that. We want to stop threats and prevent them when we can, but uh, I just see a few issues and problems here. So first, the records, and there's no need to, I mean, you can respond to the cardiology <laughs> thing, but the record thing is first, Senator Bingham. Thank you Thank for you. those I'll, I'll, comments. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now. Senator Chamberlain, very good comments. Uh, Senator Swazinski, Swazinski. Thank you, question. Madam Chair. I don't really have a question. I'd just like to thank the presenters today from everybody and the senators and their bills. I just got to say, I can't let um, the day go by without me not saying what I want to say, though. When this education policy and finance committee was established, whenever it was, I'm sure their prominent role was to talk about reading and writing and arithmetic and citizenship. And I just spent an hour and a half of my life listening to threat assessments and opioid addiction and suicide prevention. And I hope that somehow someone is somewhere with the vision and the wisdom to figure this out so that we can go, so the next generation of legislators are sitting around again talking about reading, writing, arithmetic, and citizenship rather than trying to keep our kids and our teachers and our counselors and our nurses safe from um, people that want to cause us all threat and harm. And um, I hope that person is listening right now, wherever you are. Thank you. And thanks again for everybody's testimony. Thank you, Senator Swadzinski. Any other questions, comments? Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I just want to call attention, uh, I know Senator Clausen had to leave, but one of the things that is referenced in this bill is the Department of Public Safety School Safety Center. And um, we're asking them to do more things under this bill, and they're already on really limited resources. And I know that Senator Clausen has a bill that would help address that. So I just wanted to, to call attention to, um, that is a very valuable resource to our, to our schools. Um, many, many school districts are using those resources right now, um, and we need to make sure that, that it is able to really serve our students. Thank you, Senator Kent. Any further comments? Uh, Senator Weger. Senator Weger, yes. we're gonna keep them brief because I know we all have places we need to be here in a couple minutes. Senator Weger. I'll be, no comment. I'm curious if uh, Mr. Amoroso has any testimony. There are directives to superintendents. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Amoroso, do you have comments on this bill? You've been summoned. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Madam Amoroso. Chair. Uh, Gary Amaros, Executive Director, Minnesota Association of School Administrators. Our biggest issue last year with this was, uh, <coughs> at one point in time, was a conversation that a, uh, each school within the district had to have its own unique assessment team. And I believe that the bill in front of us provides that uh, an assessment team can serve more than one school. Yeah. That was our biggest issue. That issue has been rectified. Uh, therefore, we would not have testified today unless we would have been called up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Amoroso. Any further comments, members? Um, members, I, I, I'm a co-sponsor on this bill, but, but I'm concerned. Uh, and first, I want to thank uh, Captain McAllister for your service and, and for being here today as well. But I thank you for stepping up and keeping us safe every day. I appreciate that. And uh, Doctor, I thank you for your testimony as well. Um, I'm concerned because of some of the comments we heard today, and I'm concerned uh, specifically about if this is duplicative to what is already happening. There's been enough um, questions raised, including criminal liability and others, and I see that we are out of time here, but judiciary does need to look at yes. this bill. And so I amend my first motion and uh, rephrase it to be referred to judiciary without recommendation. So that will be my motion uh, going forward. Judiciary will take a look at this. Maybe some of these questions will be answered. Uh, if in fact it is to pass out of judiciary, it needs to come back here because it does have a finance note. So with that, all in favor of the bill being uh, referred to judiciary without recommendation, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. <coughs> 
Passed. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Senator Bingham. Uh, excuse me. This meeting is adjourned. Uh, we will be meeting next on February 13th.